didn't put a foot wrong. That was a, a majestic performance, commanding from the front and with great skill, uh, great skill in very difficult conditions. Why did Lewis only take a new internal combustion engine, an ICE, this weekend in Istanbul? I'm going to get to the answer of that, but I need to just give a bit of background first. The so-called power unit, the entire uh, device that propels the car forward, is made up of, of seven different components. The ICE, the internal combustion engine, the turbo, the MGUH, the MGUK, the energy store, that's the battery, the control electronics that go with it, and the exhaust system, that's seven elements. Each of those seven elements, you're allowed limited quantities in an entire championship. If you replace any of those seven elements above the minimum that you're allowed, sorry, the maximum that you're allowed, then you take a penalty, and you take 10 place penalty for each of the elements that exceeds its permitted number. In our car, we know that it's going to be a challenge to get to the end of the year with the internal combustion engines that Lewis had, the three that he's permitted. So we had to choose a moment where it was uh, judicious for us to introduce a new one to give us a good shot at running to the end of, this, uh, the, end of the championship in good shape. Now we could of course have replaced the entire power unit, but if you do that, then you're replacing each of those seven elements taking 10 places for the first, and then 10 places for the second, and then, of course, you're at the back of the grid. So the moment you take more than two elements, you're at the back, and you might as well take all the others to go with it. But in our case, the area that we wanted to, to give the maximum amount of reassurance to us over the remaining part of the season was the internal combustion engine. And if we limited our change to just that, then we could take just the 10 places, not be at the back of the grid, and then our biggest worry at that point would just be the heart and the mouth that we would experience at the start of the race, keeping our fingers and our toes crossed that Lewis would get round that first corner safely. And indeed, that was a very tense moment for all of us in that damp and slippery start, and it was a great relief to see him emerge unscathed around that first corner. Did we consider undercutting Perez around lap 36, 37, when most of the stops took place? The answer is yes, we did consider it. But in order to understand why we didn't do it, you have to understand a little bit of the strategist's dilemma. The strategist doesn't know what will happen in the future, has no guarantees of anything, and all the strategist can do is play the best hand that they can. They're trying to maximize the odds, the probability of success, but they can't guarantee anything. So sitting as we were behind Perez, uh, approaching that sort of lap 36, 37 mark, with a car that was quicker than Perez but penned in by it, you've got to consider the things that were, were running through our minds at the time and principally running through James Vowles's mind, our chief strategist. Yes, it's possible we might have made an undercut, but you have to remember that when you come out on fresh intermediate tyres, on a track that is no longer covered in water and is actually nearer to dry than it was to wet, then those tyres have to be treated with kid gloves in the opening laps, else they tear themselves to pieces and suffer from what we call heavy graining. So instead of what you can normally do, which is come straight out on new rubber, hit it and get a jump on someone, we would have had to come out and then be super careful on that new rubber, so pretty tough to undercut in those circumstances. Set against that, two other things. Firstly, if, uh, if um, we waited and maybe Perez came in, then we would then take, uh, take track position over Perez without having to overtake him. And if we could then hang on to our tyres, then that would have been the easiest overtake in the world. And uh, so that's, that's sitting there in your mind as well. And then the final consideration, it was a drying track. Perhaps it was going to go fully dry and we were going to want to go onto slicks. The car that could get from intermediates onto slicks and just in one change, that would be a car that would do very, very well at the end of the race. So while, uh, while the opportunity of an undercut was hypothetically there, weighing up those other opportunities against it made us not want to take it. And uh, in the end, it probably uh, would not have succeeded as an undercut, 
but maybe would have been a good thing to do with the benefit of hindsight in terms of the right point in the race to put new rubber on. A question that lots and lots of people will no doubt want answered, would our tyres have survived right to the end of the race? I think the answer to that is, would we still have had inflated tyres uh, that would be capable of going round the track? Yes, we, in, all, in all likelihood, we would, have, we would have got to the end of the race on one set of tyres, uh, able to circulate uh, without difficulty. Um, other cars did that, Ocon did that, for example, and our car typically runs its rubber better than many of, the, of our competitors. So yes, we would have got to the end of the race. The question is, how quick would we have been? And the evidence there is pretty clear. We would have been very slow. Uh, the tyre was using its rubber throughout the entire uh, race and towards the end, as the track approached dry but never quite got there, then that wear accelerated. And Lewis's lap times were starting to get worse, sort of lap by lap by lap. And while he would have made it to the end of the race, the pace would have been really quite dismal by the time he got there. What would have been the best strategy in hindsight after analysing all the data of the race? As ever with strategy, at the end of the race, it's always obvious. Always obvious to know what would have been the perfect lap because at the end of the race, you have full visibility of what would have happened. However, uh, if we look at it uh, overall, the best, the best lap time to have stopped would have been around the 36, 37 mark. That was when Valtteri and Verstappen stopped. And had Lewis done the same and then treated his tyres uh, nice and gently, then uh, in all likelihood he would have come in a strong fourth, uh, maybe be able to pressurise Perez for third and perhaps overtake him. That would have been optimum. We didn't do that. We stayed out for longer than that, hoping that the track would go dry, hoping for a little while that the tyres would last, that they would hang on and we would get the easiest third place uh, on, on, on offer at the time, simply by inheriting it from those that did do a pit stop. But a few laps into that extended run when all the other people had stopped and with Lewis's tyres going south pretty rapidly, it became clear that we wish we'd stopped a bit earlier. Now, we, I think the optimum would have been 36, 37. By the time we realised that we should have made that stop then and we were looking to cut our losses, it was around about lap 41. And that, uh, that too would have been okay. That would have been uh, a fourth place type of, of stop. In the end, we pushed on uh, a bit longer than that, another nine laps with the tyres uh, degrading all the while. And when we eventually did call Lewis in, it was because the lap time chart that we used to make our predictions was telling us that, that it was not looking good for hanging on to the end of the race, that the car's pace by then would be sufficiently poor that he wouldn't hang on to the place that he was holding at the time. And we were, we were looking uh, at something that was somewhere in the region of seventh, eighth, eighth place. Uh, based on the way in which the tyres were progressively degrading. Now, if you gave, if you gave some sort of fairly heroic assumptions uh, about the, what the tyres would do from the lap where we did eventually come in, lap 51, if you said from that lap forward they would suffer no further damage as a result of, of the remaining laps in the race, then you could just about convince yourself that Lewis would have come fourth rather than the fifth he did come. However, that is a pretty heroic assumption because actually the tyres were just slipping more and more and degrading more and more. And if you put a more realistic uh, prediction of what would have happened, then you see that Lewis would have come in around about the seventh place, possibly even eighth. So the strategist's choice, always trying to give you the best option, is looking at that and thinking, well, I've got very, very low odds of being able to hang on to fourth, no chance at all of hanging on to the third I'm currently in, and highly likely to be seventh with an outside chance that I might be eighth. But if I come in, I'm easy peasy gonna secure fifth. And you can see why if you're playing a hand of poker like that, you're gonna choose the best option. And the best option for us having missed out on the earlier call was to come in and secure that fifth place, which is what we did. Considering that our Inters had transformed themselves pretty much into sort of de facto slicks at the time that we did stop, 
why didn't we opt for softs, which are slick tyres themselves? The answer is that although the, you're right that the tyres had in fact worn away all of their, all of their uh, sort of groove tread pattern, it didn't mean that the slick rubber would have been okay because there was no dry line on the track. The humidity of the day, the sort of continuous presence of, of drizzle in the air, the temperature of the day meant that the track temperatures and the sort of general moisture on the surface would have meant that if we had come out on slicks, as they, as they left the pits all nice and hot from their blankets, um, very soon after, a corner or two afterwards, they would have dropped in temperature down below the level at which that rubber functions because the dry tyres aren't just dry tyres because they don't have tread, they're dry tyres because the rubber is fundamentally designed for going at a certain speed, uh, having a certain amount of energy put through it and therefore operating at a much higher temperature than the intermediate rubber was. So although the intermediate rubber was, had, had worn away to near slick, its temperature is much, much lower than the dry tyre would have been. So the intermediate tyre as a slick is able to grip the track because it's a softer rubber able to operate at those lower temperatures. Put on a proper dry though and head out on a greasy, coldish uh, track in those humid conditions, all the temperature would have gone after a corner or two and it would have been, uh, would have been a disaster. And indeed, the, the one intrepid driver who did try that, Sebastian uh, Vettel, very quickly found that out. Why did Lewis lose as much time as he did in the few laps that we had after the pit stop? This is a, uh, a phenomenon called graining that caused that. Um, if you looked at Lewis's very first lap when the tyres were absolutely virgin, he was closing in on Leclerc ahead at something like three and a half seconds a lap in his first lap. But thereafter, he dropped back quite substantially. And in fact, uh, Leclerc was able to pull away from him again. And far from chasing down the people in front on his new tires, he was actually, Lewis was actually under threat for a little while by Gasly and, and Norris behind. This, this behavior, this quite sharp change of grip in the tire is caused by graining. Graining is when the surface of the tire is gripping the road very nicely, but the rubber in between uh, the carcass of the tyre and the surface of the tyre is being pulled this way and that as the car goes round a corner and uh, the tyre is going one way, the surface of the tyre is staying in contact with the road, the rubber is stretched and stretched and stretched and at a certain point it just can't cope and it tears, leaving a bit of itself behind on the road and, and the car sliding uh, as the tyre breaks free. This happens corner after corner with the tyre shredding itself uh, as it grips and then breaks, grips and then breaks, uh, leaving the rubber behind on the road. This, this graining is ruinous for the car's performance and can turn an otherwise competitive machine into something really quite poor. And for a little while it made, meant that Lewis was under a degree of threat from behind. Happily, before that threat could really properly materialise, enough rubber got thrown away by the tyre progressively uh, graining and tearing uh, uh, the surface away, that you get uh, a smaller amount of tread left behind. And as the tread reduces in thickness and the amount that the rubber is being stretched and squished reduces, so too does its temperature drop. And as its temperature drops, it starts to, uh, to get under control and the graining problem stops. So we were lucky, we were lucky that the uh, that the graining didn't actually cost us places to those uh, folk behind and it would have been better for us to have stopped earlier so that we could have bought the tyres in gently going very very much slower than the tyre was capable of in the first four or five laps until a bit of wear had taken place and then you can lean on it and then the pace will come which is pretty much what Valtteri did uh, in his stop very conservative at the beginning, bought the tyre in, and then devastatingly fast at the end when he got fastest lap. Could Valtteri have run a less perfect race than that? I think I'd prefer to write, ask that question the other way around. Could it have been more perfect? Uh, the answer is no, he didn't put a foot wrong. That was a, a majestic performance, commanding from the front and with great skill, uh, great skill in very difficult conditions, skill that required him not to be too greedy at any point in the race. 
He knew he had a fast car. He knew he'd spent the weekend getting it really nicely balanced. And he knew he had a fantastic opportunity of a win. However, he also knew, he also knew that the margin between really competitive performance in the car and tire disaster is very fine. A little bit of, uh, of, of, of heavy right foot, a bit of clumsiness here or there would have seen the tire damaged to a point where the inherent advantage of the car would all have washed away to nothing. And instead he drove a very, very controlled race well within himself, just eking out a small amount over Verstappen behind uh, to protect himself, allowing that gap to grow to first two, then three, then four seconds as the race progressed. Very, very commanding, mature performance, and especially, especially after the pit stop. A pit stop that we did to, uh, to uh, mirror and match what, uh, what Max Verstappen had done a lap earlier, and then with uh, Valtteri on fresh tyres, making sure that he he drove uh, very gently on that, that fresh rubber, avoiding the graining so that he could then be completely protected and strong in the closing laps of the race. He was uh, full of beaming smiles afterwards and with absolute justification. It was a great, great performance and uh, brilliant for the team. Why didn't the track dry out as expected? Two years running at, uh, at Istanbul and two years where where the track threatened to dry but never quite did. Or oh, I think actually last year it eventually did. But this, this year um, it, uh, it ran uh, all the way through with us thinking at the beginning of the race, mm, 15 laps and it'll go dry. And then, and then 15 laps in we're thinking mm, another 15 perhaps and it'll go dry. And even when, when the leaders of the race were stopping and Lewis was, was pushing on uh, on that, set of intermediates from the start of the race uh, trying to see if he could hang on the main thing that was motivating us was hanging on because it was going to go dry and of course it never did it never did go dry and this is just a feature of of the ambient uh, weather conditions with the moisture in the air uh, the low sort of persistent drizzle here and there throughout throughout the day uh, in a very very humid environment on a track surface that is very, very smooth asphalt that doesn't sort of drain away or, or wash away quickly on a surface which itself um, is, is, is difficult for, for the tires to, to grip unless the temperature of the tire can be held very high and, and of course um, difficult to achieve uh, that high temperature for a slick rubber when, uh, when, when the track is sort of, sort of cold and greasy in that ambient condition. So all the way through, all the teams would be thinking to themselves, it's going to go dry, it's going to go dry. Um, but, but it never quite did. How confident are we for the rest of the season, having seen the good pace of our car in Turkey? I think it's difficult to take Turkey as a sort of yardstick for what we can expect from the rest of the season. It was a very strong weekend. We were looking good all the way through, uh, dry, wet, uh, free practice, qualifying race, we were, we were strong this weekend. But it's an unusual sort of place, it's an unusual sort of tarmac. Um, one of our uh, uh, engineers this weekend spoke uh, about the tyres as being in a sort of Goldilocks place this weekend, not too hot, not too cold, on an asphalt that's particularly picky. And, uh, and we knew that we were very strong, but we also knew that the margins between this strength uh, and, and being more average were quite slender, a few degrees here or there, and we could have been out of the Goldilocks zone on the hot or the cold side. So it was a very good performance. The car was very well balanced. We didn't seem to suffer as much from the understeer that was fairly prevalent up and down the pit lane uh, this weekend. But I don't think you could read that automatically into the races to come. I think probably a better read would be to say, well, let's look back at the last six or so. In Silverstone, we put a decent upgrade package on our car and it has sort of uh, made our season a happier place. In the, in the races since then, I think there's only been one where we were comprehensively beaten and that was Zandvoort. On the others, I think arguably we have shaded it with the quickest car. And in a couple of places like Istanbul, Sochi, um, we, we were proper good, Monza too good as well. 
Um, so on average, I think we have shaded it, but in most of those places where we've been the quicker car, it's been more of a, a sort of coin toss uh, than a sort of guarantee. What I think that means is that uh, we at least are in the fight. We are enjoying, as we said to each other at the beginning of this season, we're enjoying the hunt for this title because that's what, that's what it's felt like ever since winter testing. We're trying to hunt down this title. And, uh, you know, if, if we can work well with our car over the races to come, we have something that does look competitive enough to be in that fight. There's more than, it, more than just speed that will determine the outcome of these races, though, as, as, the, as the last several have shown us. There's reliability, there is pit stops, there is weather, there's the whole gamut of things that, that is, a, is the sort of excitement of an F1 race. And we have to perform well in, in all of those. But we're in with a fighting chance. It's a thrilling season. And, uh, and these, these, um, these last few races should make this a season that will, will be thought of for many years to come as one of the classics in F1. Thank you very much indeed for all your questions and we will be back in a couple of weeks time to answer some more of them after the United States Grand Prix.